Greetings, listener, and welcome to a bonus episode of Ryan Rambles You to Rest, the podcast where I lull you to a state of unconsciousness with the deeply dull drone of my voice. Because it is the scariest month of the year, besides April when taxes are due, I thought it would be enjoyable to take a little detour with attention to some of the curious confections of this frightening time. We will begin this journey with the scroll of my own favorite Halloween candies, and then dawdle down a far less interesting alley for a particular ponder of the perennial classic, the divisive dental damager, the infamous holiday candy of the corn variety. Before we begin, I would like to recommend that you subscribe to this show on your podcast platform of choice or YouTube. For news and announcements, follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Ryan Rambles Pod, or follow me at Anvil1 on Twitter. Our soundtrack is by Disparition. <laughs> This year is the first year since I can remember, easily in two decades, that I have lived in a place where I may find myself in the position to, if not the obligation to, engage with trick and or treaters at the entranceway of my own home and be prepared as such to provide at their behest a reasonable amount and desirable quality of sugary sweet snacks for their future own consumption, in return for nothing besides perhaps their excitement, charming outfits, mild disappointment, or look of horror on the face of their parents. As of this recording, we have not acquired our final bounty of candies for the Halloween event. Although we did not procure a not insignificant amount, which in the interim has found its way into our own stomachs and those of other house guests long before the opportunity to be stowed in bulging bags of sweets foisted at us by tiny costumed carnies. It was this particular acquisition, dear listener, that reminded me of the highs and lows of my own experience as a youth in the efforts of collecting mass quantities of chocolate, and indeed other sweets, in the hopes that they may last until the following Halloween. They never did. And although I don't recall my young self to be the candy bender type, they surely never lasted even close to long enough. What we all know, of course, too, is that there are good and bad treats to encounter in the journey of filling a sack, bag, pillowcase, or plastic pumpkin as close to capacity as will allow in one single evening. Although I understand that the absolute best variety of candy treats are a subjective matter, And indeed, I have missed these years past perhaps some of the finest new types from modern Wonka factories. I feel, too, that we can likely agree that there are a handful of objectively objectionable options that may find their way to your candy-craving claws. These are they. Raisins and candy corn. To begin with, raisins are not candy, and that is the end of that. Candy corn is another matter to be explored later. Now, with that out of the way, rather than doing a roundup of Halloween candy I know, 
which likely would only lead to recalling, as we might imagine, two or three candies, and possibly by accident, one or two fruits. I have chosen to opt this time into the scroll. I have located for our interest an article on Thrillist entitled Best Halloween Candies of All Time. Ranked. With the dubious deck, you're never too old to go trick-or-treating, which I do not care to unpack at this time. Authored by Andy Kreitza, and most recently updated on the 19th of September, 2022, at 9.31 a.m. There is no indication with regard to the time zone of that update. I would also like to caution that I shall count up, rather than down, through this scroll. It would be a shame to need to cut short this segment without reaching what are likely several of the most highly considered candies by public consensus. Here now, let us explore the very best Halloween candies in this scroll. The first candy on this Thrillist list is the Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. I am inclined to agree that this deserves to be number one, in part because I have spent no time looking at the rest of this list. I'm not sure even if the Reese's Peanut Butter Cup is my own favorite, but it's hard to argue with the Reese's Peanut Butter Cup in the number one position. It's undoubtedly in the top, and it is delicious, and it does include the great combination of chocolate and peanut butter. Now, I don't usually turn to peanut butter cups for my chocolate and peanut butter craving, for that, I have a local ice cream shop that makes a fantastic classic chocolate ice cream. And then I have my own jar of peanut butter. At least once a week, I have a very small bowl of peanut butter and chocolate ice cream. It's really about as good as it gets when it comes to the at-home ice cream experience, and providing your own peanut butter is clutch. I didn't know this for many years of my life, and my partner taught it to me. You can choose a quality peanut butter as your peanut butter of choice, and I recommend exploring the options at peanut butter to find the one that you feel goes best with ice cream and finding your best ice cream. As I've said, I like to stick to the traditional and go with chocolate. And if you choose your own peanut butter, then you don't need to purchase a chocolate and peanut butter ice cream where the peanut butter is of dubious quality to begin with. Now, we aren't doing a scroll of ice creams, but I do think it's fair to say that chocolate in general tends to demand a high placing when it comes to where it participates in flavor or sweets. Many things are simply made better by chocolate, if not when chocolate is the star. As such, I like to buy in large quantities chocolate ice cream from my local ice cream shop. We will sometimes get another flavor of ice cream to shake things up a little, 
But chocolate is the go-to. Chocolate is always there. Chocolate is necessary. Although I will say, as a side note, that I have become very appreciative of the newer, sort of modern, if not postmodern flavors that we've gotten recently from sweets focused dessert creators in San Francisco and probably a few other cities there is definitely a trend for what you might call grown up ice cream where there are flavors that aren't just about being super sugary and sweet but what i like is the stuff that is supposed to be sugary and sweet in particular, I'm thinking about, I had a milkshake at Shake Shack, which was a collaboration with Christina Tozzi of Milk Bar. And of course, she is basically famous for bringing the flavor of breakfast cereal and ice cream together. And in milkshake form, it was truly divine and I have sought it ever since. In fact, I have considered making my own ice cream. We have a maker here, but I haven't gotten around to using it. But if I do get to using it, my intent is for sure to recreate the cereal-flavored ice cream, which I think is done with something as simply as Frosted Flakes and you basically steep them in milk to impart the cereal flavor to the milk for the ice cream. I don't expect to be successful on my first try, but we can hope, and I will be sure to report back to you should I be successful. In the meantime for myself, my local ice cream shop has something that is close enough. It is the birthday cake flavored ice cream, and it is quite enjoyable too. But here we have digressed from the Reese's peanut butter cup. And the Reese's peanut butter cup, again, simply makes sense to be in the number one position. It's sensible, it's not shocking. Nobody's going to call the Reese's Peanut Butter Cup at number one a hot take. And as Halloween candies go, it's good to have as many of them as possible, even if they're not your favorite. Reese's Peanut Butter Cups are always a solid turn to. As I've said, I'm not much of a sweets person in general, and as such, I'm only barely aware of the goings-on in the world of candy. And I know that the major candy companies have, over the last, say, 10 years, gotten far more involved with making alternative flavors to their tried-and-true number one candies. And so the Reese's Peanut Butter Cup Classic may not even anymore be the greatest Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. Do you have an alternative Reese's Peanut Butter Cup that's your favorite? Let me know. At number two on Thrillist's list of the best Halloween candies is Twix. Now, this one I'm not sure about. If I'm completely honest, I'm generally speaking not a giant fan of caramel. 
although the ice cream shop that I mentioned earlier has an exquisite salted caramel. But the Twix is definitely up there, I think. For me personally, it's one that I don't mind having, but I definitely won't reach for first. I will say, though, that even though it's not my favorite, I do tend to feel like, for what it is, the Twix is a solid candy. Like, I, I, I don't think that it would be very easy to improve upon it. But probably for me, not number two. My possible number two might be this list's number three, which is Snickers. Again, I'm not a giant fan of caramel, but Snickers is classic. And when I was a kid, I very much liked to put the Snickers in the freezer and have frozen Snickers. Today, I'm not entirely sure how I was able to do it. A frozen Snickers bar is murder on your teeth, but it is amazing. I think the trick might just be that when you plan on having a frozen Snickers, that you just need to take it out of the freezer and give it a little while to thaw slightly. I wouldn't call frozen solid to be perfect. But Snickers is a great candy bar. I don't know that I'm in a minority, but I feel like I might be, in that I also like nougat. What exactly is nougat? I'm really not sure, but I will say that I don't mind it. And similar to Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, I feel like Snickers just gets an honorary position towards the top. It's hard to mess with the champ. It's got a lot of ingredients and it tastes like it's full of things. As I've said, I don't get candy very often anymore, but Snickers is definitely on a list of candies that I still think very highly of. And if I'm going to be eating from a variety of Halloween candy this year, which does seem to be part of my future, I will definitely make sure that there are Snickers involved, and very likely will have to freeze at least one of them. Number four on this scroll is the Kit Kat, and I'm actually kind of a fan of Kit Kats, but I do personally recognize that that's maybe a personal thing. Compared to other candies, they are slightly on the boring side. It's just chocolate and sugar wafer, and I'm not sure what else. But the uh, little two-bar stuck-together combo you get from a Halloween-sized Kit Kat is pretty good. And with all Kit Kats, I will confess that one of my favorite things about Kit Kats is nibbling the broken edge from the, the break that you made by separating the wafers. Slightly similar to if you like to eat the crown around the edge of a peanut butter cup. So the Kit Kat is pretty solid, and I will say that although, once again, I have been more or less out of the candy loop, 
I have, over the last few years, had the occasion to try a few different types of KitKat. In fact, it's possible that I've had more KitKats than anything else in the last decade. Recently, I came across and enjoyed quite a lot the Cookies and Cream KitKat. If you haven't had it before, it's a pretty delightful experience. It, of course, doesn't compare to a solid cookies and cream ice cream, but it's quite good. And here in San Francisco, we tend to get variations available in different Asian countries fairly easily. And there was a period of time where the green tea Kit Kat was making the rounds, and as I recall, that one was pretty good too. I think Kit Kat is pretty solid. One of the things I like about it, as somebody who doesn't have a major sweet tooth, is that it's kind of low stakes. It's not filled with a lot of things. It's not especially hard. It's not especially chewy. It's just a pretty simple candy. And if you don't want anything intense, the Kit Kat is kind of there for you. Moving on to number five, as we continue to count backwards through the rankings of Halloween candy using the article on Thrillist is Butterfinger. Now, I will say that I'm simply not a Butterfinger fan. And I hope that doesn't upset anyone or drive you awake for any particular reason. It's simply not my preferred candy. And I might just leave it at that. Say that Butterfinger here at five, I'll leave that to y'all. If you like Butterfinger and think it should be here, then who am I to disagree with you? I don't really have much of a connection to Butterfinger, and it was the kind of candy for me, because I wasn't a fan of it, I think it might have been the toffee element, that I considered Butterfinger one of the best, and maybe along with Twix too, the better trade candies if I wanted to trade with somebody to get more of what I wanted, if I wanted more Kit Kat or Snickers. So maybe you benefited from someone like me when you were younger and were able to fleece me of Butterfinger in favor of Snickers or Kit Kat. Next up is 100 grand. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to skip it. I honestly don't remember the last time I had a 100 grand, and I don't think I was ever excited to get one as Halloween candy. Although I see that the author of this article is calling out 100 grand as a highly underrated and overlooked candy. Number seven is a personal favorite of mine, Mr. Goodbar. When I was growing up, when it came to Hershey's chocolate and I know that for a lot of people that I know now in my adult life, Hershey's chocolate is not good to them. 
But I grew up in Pennsylvania, and we had Hershey's chocolate because it was, you know, not just a national brand, but it was kind of a local thing. And of all of the sort of top-level Hershey's chocolate bars, Mr. Good Bar was definitely my favorite. I think that if I was hard-pressed to name a favorite chocolate bar, that I might actually go with Mr. Good Bar. It's just chocolate and peanuts, but here again, chocolate and peanut flavor is a great combination. And I suppose I may just say in defense of Hershey's chocolate that while it's not as great as many of the more refined brands of chocolate, I still kind of like just the basic creamy chocolatiness that's not too dark of Hershey's chocolate. And if I was to choose between the larger brands, I would probably choose Hershey over Nestle. Which brings us to Nestle Crunch, number eight. I think that Nestle Crunch is, to me, another good, just sort of backup candy. It's definitely not what you seek out, but I don't find it particularly disagreeable either. There will be a point when the better candy bars are gone in the Halloween candy, and I think that Nestle Crunch is an acceptable bar if you just need something in the moment. It's maybe also one that you can pair with your popular but not favorites to make a good trade. And it's a little bit novel. I like the rice puff chocolate combination. It's definitely unusual. It's not a combination that you find very often in other places. You know, we talk about chocolate and peanut butter being a extremely classic combination, but chocolate and rice doesn't immediately jump out. Although I'm sure I could be, you know, re-educated on the subject matter and likely find out that there's quite a lot more rice puff or rice and chocolate combos than I'm fully aware of. Rice is an important part of food all over the world, so that there would be other rice and chocolate combinations in other places wouldn't surprise me. Obviously, there is the popular cereal, Cocoa Krispies, and of course there are Rice Krispie treats that can be dipped in chocolate, so there's definitely some precedent out there, but I still think of Nestle's Crunch as its own unique thing. Coming in just inside the top ten is Reese's Pieces. Reese's Pieces are definitely a favorite of mine as a candy. But I'm not sure that I'm a fan as a Halloween candy. The trouble with the candies that are, you know, small pieces or you know, like M&M's or Reese's Pieces, is that usually the Halloween version of them is just not enough to be satisfying. Like one small 
handful of Reese's Pieces and, you know, you, you gotta have something else on top of that. But I do like Reese's Pieces. And I'm not sure that the larger version is significantly better in terms of quantity because sometimes I find it to be too much. I think Reese's Pieces work maybe best as a movie theater candy. Up there maybe with Junior Mints and Red Vines as like classic movie theater candy. They're definitely good and they're definitely one of my favorites, but are they the best Halloween candy? I think that is definitely open to debate. I really like Reese's Pieces as a topping with ice cream as well. When I was a kid, we had a diner chain that I don't think ever really made it to California, but I've seen in a few different states it was called Friendly's. And we went there a bunch when I was a kid, and Friendly's had a Reese's Sunday that was quite exquisite. Ice cream, hot fudge, Reese's Pieces, whipped cream, I think cherry on top, just outstanding. So if this was a list of top candies, or top ice cream toppings, or top movie theater candies, I'd be right there and all about it with Reese's Pieces. But for Halloween, I'm not sure. Number 10 is Hershey's Bars, the straight-up standard Hershey's milk chocolate candy bar. I think that maybe it's a little unexciting as a Halloween candy. Don't get me wrong, I, I like Hershey bars, but top 10, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what comes after, like where does the top 20 go? And I'll try to get us through the top 20, if I, even if I have to go a little bit faster moving forward. But Hershey's surely is a classic. I probably wouldn't reach directly for them if I had a bowl of candy in front of me. But I feel like you're still happy to have them in the bag. Like, you're gonna want them. And sometimes all you want is a little bit of a basic bit of chocolate. Next up is Starburst. I'm kind of medium on that one. I'm a sometimes fan of Starburst. I definitely have to be in the mood but I, I will say that I, I think they deserve to be up there. And as a Halloween candy, a packet of Starburst I think is two. And that's a good number of Starburst. Like, that's a little treat. Two will last you, you know, however many minutes. And you get two flavors. If you don't want to, maybe it's just the, the benefit of having two options if you don't get a flavor you like. So Starburst I like. I think, I think they should be up there. I think that's a good, good, good one on here. I don't have any particular favorite in mind of Starburst, though. To me, they're almost all interchangeable.
And, you know, among the non-chocolate treats, they're definitely up there as well. I think off the top of my head, there's one that I would rate higher, if not two. But I think Starburst are, are a solid non-chocolate, and, and it's okay for them to be up here. I'm even a little bit surprised that the Starburst aren't in the top ten, really. They're just outside here at number eleven. At number 12 is the Heath Bar. I don't remember caring for these. I don't think I've had one in a very long time. I have to treat this one like a hundred grand of just, I don't know, it's just not up my alley. Number 13 on this list is Flavored Tootsie Rolls. Well, I do, I'm honestly just not familiar. I'm familiar with Tootsie Rolls, and I've definitely never been a fan of them. So if these flavored ones really take it to another level, then okay. I'll, I'll Maybe I'll, I'll give them another shot. Maybe during Halloween I will come across some of these flavored Tootsie Rolls, and I'll have an opinion to report back with. But as of right now, I'm not all about the Tootsie Roll option. I would maybe say the Tootsie Pop is okay. You get a lollipop and then you have the, the, the Tootsie Center, which is kind of gross, to be honest. I don't know. I was trying to maybe meet halfway on the Tootsie products, but I'm just not a fan. Fourteen is M&M's. Um, I would probably rate M&M's higher, although they have the same problem as Reese's Pieces. You generally don't get enough of them in a single package. I think the Whatever the classic, regular-sized M&M package is, is the ideal package. So I think, again, these ones, they come down a peg of just being the not-ideal quantity. And if I see this list correctly, this is a catch-all for M&Ms. So this would include peanut M&Ms, and I definitely like peanut M&Ms as well. Again, it's, it's hard to beat that peanut and chocolate combination. Now, M&Ms have over the years been met with some controversy and internet attention. I haven't paid super close attention, but I, I've been vaguely aware of it. I am an anti-blue M&M person. I am one of those people. I will take all of the blue M&Ms out. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but I just associate blue with, like, fruity candy. And I'm also not too big on the red M&Ms. For me, really, it's about when I grew up, and the time that I grew up was, I believe, after the original Red M&M was discontinued, and before it came back many years later. So I grew up with M&Ms only having a few colors. So there were you know, two, I believe, two colors of brown, green, yellow, and maybe orange, I'm not sure. But in any case, there were, you know, these two, 
these two other colors weren't a part of M&M's for me growing up. So I, I don't necessarily fault anyone for liking them, but personally I'm not going to do the blue M&M's. If you're hanging out with me and I have a bag of M&M's, you can have my blue M&M's. Next up is Baby Ruth at 15. It's at this point that I do have to purely acknowledge that the author of this article and I do not see completely eye to eye. And as such, I'm going to try to gloss over some of these that don't make my personal cut. I am not a fan of Baby Ruth. As the author of this article points out, there is some Goonies nostalgia that goes with the candy bar, and that is okay. Goonies is a fantastic movie, or at least I remember it as such. I haven't watched Goonies in a few years, but it was one of my favorites as a kid. And it's got so many actors that were a big deal later on, too. Like, it's a who's who. I believe most of them had big spikes in their careers from time to time. And even recently, the fella who played Data appeared in everything, everywhere, all at once, which is probably the best film of the year. I was pretty impressed by it. It's not often that you see a heartwarming family story with positive role models inside of a multiverse action movie. It delightfully bucks the trend of just violence, gratuitous violence in action movies. In any case, he's quite good in the film, and the film should get Oscars. What I always liked about Goonies is that it truly was a great kids movie in that it operated inside of a kid understandable space. They're all neighborhood friends. They're different ages. They have different friendships and conflicts and all of that passes through the movie. Then you add some bad guys that are, you know, very sort of stereotypical criminals. And then you add on to that a fantastic quest that happens to be in their town. Coming in at number 16 is Twizzlers. I don't care for Twizzlers very much. I'm a Red Vines person. Twizzlers tend to be harder and more plasticky than I like, and I do rather like Red Vines. And in particular, I like fresh Red Vines that are pretty soft and not super chewy. They're maybe not ideal for using them as a straw that way, but I do think they taste better that way. And they're in that category of actually quite good as a movie theater candy and not so much as a Halloween candy. Now, I don't know if there are Halloween-sized red vines, but there are Twizzlers, 
and they just don't really make the cut for me. At 17 is Junior Mints. Junior Mints are probably my favorite up there and my favorites of childhood candy. And they're my number one for the movie theater. And if your movie theater happens to have them in a freezer, all the better. Cold Junior Mints are great. I like having them at a movie, but I don't see them that often. I don't think about it that often either, but if they happen to catch my eye, like if I'm looking at the concession stand and I see a freezer with a, you know, like a clear glass door and I see Junior Mints in there, that definitely has me thinking about whether I should get them. It's not very often, but sometimes I do. And then usually what happens with me is that I get partway through the box at the movie, and then I bring the box home, and then the box sits in my freezer for another six months or longer before I remember that it's there and that it can be enjoyed during a movie at home. But I would definitely say Junior Mints are probably the top of my movie theater list. For Halloween, again, I think you have the same issue with all of the pieces candies of you know, is a small box good enough? And I think maybe for Junior Mints it is because they're so powerful, but it's been so long since I've had them for Halloween, I don't even remember how many Junior Mints you get. In a weird way, even though I like them a lot, I would maybe even push them further down the list as a Halloween candy. But they are a favorite of mine, and that won't change. At 18, we have Haribo gummies. I don't think I ever got Haribo gummies as a kid, but I think that's fine. Haribo gummies are fantastic. Like Junior Mints, another one that is fun to put in the freezer and enjoy cold. I had, you know, gummy bears as a kid, but I don't think I really appreciated them until I had the Haribo gummies uh, after I got older. So they're solid, and I think they could even be further up this list, especially for a very good non-chocolate candy. Moving a little bit more quickly, 19 is Payday. Payday is another one that I don't have a very, very much affiliation with, so I'll skip it. Coming in at 20 is Skittles. I think that's fine. They're relatively solid. I guess they're almost like, I don't know, I haven't had Skittles in a long time, but I feel like they're the, like, M&M version of Starburst. I think I was always just sort of mostly neutral with them. Like, I would eat them as a kid, sometimes I would buy them, but never a huge fan of Skittles. As they say, taste the rainbow. I, I guess so. Skittles are okay. I, I put them in the middle for sure. trucking along here. 21 is Nerds. I was definitely a fan of Nerds as a kid and probably liked them even too much. I would get them all the time. I thought the 
box was cool because you had two flavors on either side and you could decide if you wanted to have them both at once or just a little bit of one. They were definitely a very clever candy on that level. I remember there was a brief and unsuccessful breakfast cereal based on nerds that tried to continue the novelty of having two flavors in one box. Unsurprisingly, it didn't last very long. Now, to give you some context of what a weirdo I was, and I might not be getting this right, but when I was a kid, I remember when they first brought the Blizzard out at Dairy Queen, which is like a whipped ice cream treat. It's not a milkshake. It's more of a soft serve type of experience, but what they do is whip up whatever ice cream you choose plus a bunch of flavors, and I, for whatever reason, I really liked a combination that, looking back on it, and I hope I'm getting it right, it was absolutely vile. And for some reason, I, I still would have to order it. And so that was, I believe, I want to say chocolate ice cream and peanut butter, which, you know, again, great combination. But then I always had nerds added to it. And, like, I think about it today, and it just seems positively wrong. But I was into it. In their way, the fruity, sugary punch of nerds added this, like, acid to the rich, sort of creamy combination of chocolate and peanut butter. It's sort of like how, like, sea salt and caramel ice cream has, like, that saltiness... I think what the nerds brought was that tanginess that really played as an opposite to those other flavors, but I don't know if I would order it again today. If I remember correctly, the last time I was at a Dairy Queen, they didn't even have it on the menu anymore. But that was my jam. Moving along, a series here that don't quite get me. Uh, Laffy Taffy, which I don't remember ever having. Milky Way, which is definitely, in my opinion, the weakest of the three bars in their category. Which Snickers and Three Musketeers are a part of. Uh, we haven't gotten to Three Musketeers yet, but I'm, I'm guessing we'll, we will at some point in this list. Milk Duds at 24. I definitely never liked Milk Duds. I just wasn't into the, I don't know, experience. I was more of a Goobers person, which, again, chocolate and peanut butter, or chocolate and peanuts... Milk Duds, I, I think, for me, Milk Duds, I understand as being a classic. I can definitely respect that they make a list. In fact, I'm a little bit surprised they're so low here as well. Maybe, again, because we are talking about a potentially just another, you know, movie theater candy. Twenty-five is Whoppers, which also not personally a fan, but also recognize as movie fare. Twenty-six is Blow Pops. 
I don't remember having blow pops as a Halloween candy. 27, Runtz. Now, Runtz was a candy I liked. I liked a bunch of the, you know, the Wonka candies. Obviously, Nerds was up there for me, but I liked Runtz for... I felt like Runtz did a pretty good job of each of those different candies had a unique enough flavor that they stood out. Obviously, maybe even best known for the banana flavored candy in the runts. And um, I totally get that. But runts are, runts are pretty solid. Weighing in at 28 is Sour Patch Kids. I, I like Sour Patch Kids. I'm definitely a fan. I would put Sour Patch Kids way farther up this list. When it comes to the sour food, Sour Patch Kids are pretty solid. I, I, I like them. 29 is Jolly Ranchers. Jolly Ranchers, I don't know how I feel as a Halloween candy, but I am a fan of Jolly Ranchers the candy. I tend to like them, and they are a candy that I still buy because I actually use Jolly Ranchers when I'm trying to stay awake. I find that sometimes if I'm getting tired, just having a fruity, sugary candy for, you know, four or five minutes or however long it takes is a good way of, like, sort of keeping a part of you alert and helping to stay awake. I said in a, another episode of Ryan Rambles You to Rest that one of my favorite things to do is go on road trips, and I would say that it is essential to a long road trip to have a small bag of Jolly Ranchers in the driver's side storage area so that if I start to feel like I'm getting a little drowsy, that uh, I can, you know, keep myself alert by having some Jolly Ranchers. But yeah, Jolly Ranchers are pretty solid. 30 is Airheads. I, again, I'm not, I don't even remember Airheads. I can see the packaging, but I'm just not, I don't remember having them. Okay, so we're getting at, down to the end of this scroll of the best Halloween candies. And there is only one entry left. And I am going to, with this entry, and what I feel has been left off of the list, say that I don't fully agree with this list. Number 31 is... Smarties. And I don't know if I'm a total weirdo, but I've always been a fan of Smarties. When it comes to the Halloween candy that is small pieces in a package, the closest to being satisfying to me is Smarties. You get that cylinder of pieces of candy and they're all different flavors. They're not as good flavors like runts, but they're in a zone. And yes, they're chalky and powdery, but I don't know. I always kind of liked them. I think if I was going to have only one fruity flavored candy in my Halloween bag, it would be Smarties. And I'd like to have a lot of them.
But here they are at the very bottom of the list. I think at some point there were large Smarties, but I think I might have had them once, and that's too much. I like the small ones. Small ones are good. Now, my final point here is that as Milky Way and Snickers were on this list, but Three Musketeers are not. And I get it, they're the least exciting of the bunch, but they are my favorite. I am a Three Musketeers fan. As I said a little earlier, I would talk about nougat again. I'm not sure what it is, but Three Musketeers is just that wrapped with chocolate, and I'm, I've am i always liked it. I think I even liked it more as I got a little bit older. You know, still trick-or-treating age, but once I stopped trick-or-treating, I think Three Musketeers was close to the top. So Three Musketeers, I would, I would personally put in my top ten, along with Smarties. And I'm thinking, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that's left off here. There was the other Nestle, was it Nestle? Was there Crackle? Yeah, Crackle was, I think, the, maybe the, like, Hershey version of Nestle Crunch. Is that right? I, I liked Crackle as a kid, too. But as I said before, the Hershey's candies I was always kind of pleased with. So I'll add one more bonus here as I don't know when we'll talk about candy again. And this isn't a Halloween candy that I know of, but the Reese's Fast Break candy bar has got to be up there for me. That might be in my top five. I haven't had one lately, but I remember the first time I had one, and I loved it ever since. But for what it's worth, my level of appreciation for chocolate candy bars, I cannot remember the last time I bought one. Well, maybe we can return to this topic at some other time. Well, that's about as much scrolling through candy as I can handle anyway. We did get all the way through the list, and there may be others that are more insightful. Now, I will say that one candy that was left off of that list, along with Three Musketeers, that belonged off of that list, is definitely candy corn. It is the most classic Halloween candy, and is almost uniquely as such of Halloween. And candy corn will now be the topic of our next particular ponder, where we can get a better grasp of the curiosity of this candy, and where it comes from. Did you hear your favorite Halloween candy on this scroll of Halloween candies? Let me know. I would like to ponder particularly the Wikipedia article on the subject of the weird worst treat the candy corn. Herein, I expect both of us will learn quite a lot more about this sub-candy consumable. Some love it, and some hate it. Folks in the former category I either do not know personally, or they have chosen not to reveal their true nature in my presence. 
I shall try to be somewhat judicious about how much of the article I cover, although it is on a comparatively brief side for this website. I hope, too, to balance this judiciousness with an adequately slow and boring pace of presentation. Now then, let's turn to candy corn on wikipedia.org. We begin with the top level of candy corn. Candy corn is a type of small, pyramid-shaped candy typically divided into three sections of different colors, with a waxy texture and a flavor based on honey, sugar, butter, and vanilla. It is a staple candy of the fall season and the Halloween holiday in North America. Candy corn's traditional colors of yellow, orange, and white represent the colors of the fall harvest, or of corn on the cob, with the wide yellow end resembling a corn kernel. Candy corn has a reputation for generating polarizing responses, with articles referring to it as Halloween's most contentious sweet, which people either, quote, love, or, quote, hate. Well, I am probably more suitably in the latter category. I don't know that I would say that I hate candy corn, but I definitely don't care very much for it, and it has no place in trick-or-treating candy. However, it is worth noting that for me personally, I have some level of affinity with candy corn merely because it originated in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, according to the wiki card. It says here, too, that the traditional colors of yellow, orange, and white represent the fall harvest and corn, which I guess can be dual truths, but it definitely seems odd. Of course, something can represent two things, but to suggest that the deep orange represents corn is a little silly. I think that seems a little bit off. And the white of candy corn tends to be pretty white. It's not that off whitish yellow that you get from a real sweet white corn. And I suppose it's also worth mentioning, before we go too much further, that I am a fan of corn, the food, the real corn. And so this candy corn is an affront to the other food that I like. There are any number of preparations of actual corn that I like far more than candy corn. And to name a few, I would say corn on the cob, elote, esquites, corn salsa, even just corn on its own is pretty good with the right amount of salt and butter. And it goes well in so many things. It's good in a salad. It can be good in a soup or a stew. As mentioned, a salsa. It can be grilled and charred. 
It can be eaten raw. It can be boiled. And then obviously it can be used for all sorts of things because corn is one of our biggest crops. And it's a feed, it's a filler, it's used for its sugar. But these candy corns, I don't know if we need them. Now, here we have a history section, which I feel like will have to be the most interesting part of this journey. Quote, Chicken feed was the original name of the candy, with production starting in the late 1880s. So, right out of the gate, it was named for animal food, which is maybe fair. It was first invented in the 1880s by a Wonderl Candy Company employee, George Renninger. So, there you go. If you are confronted with the opportunity to go back in time and stop one person in history, you now know the name of George Renninger the inventor of chicken feed at the Wonderl Candy Company. Wonderl Candy Company was the first to produce the candy in 1888. The Golitz Confectionery Company, now called Jelly Belly, began manufacturing the product in 1898. While Jelly Belly still makes candy corn, the largest manufacturer of candy corn is Brock's Confections, owned by the Ferrera Candy Company. Brock's makes approximately 7 billion pieces of candy corn per year and possesses 85% of the total share of the candy corn industry during the Halloween season. So if you're not feeling like traveling back in time to affect candy corn, you now know that the Brock's Company, which has, to my memory, dubiously okay candy to begin with, produces 85% of the total share of candy corn in the Halloween season. Along with other agriculture-inspired treats at the time in the late 19th century, America's confectioners sought to market candy corn to a largely rural society. During the late 19th century, buttercream candies, molded into many types of nature-inspired shapes, including chestnuts, turnips, and clover leaves, were quite popular, but what made candy corn stand out was its bright and iconic tricolor layering. Although it is currently most popular in the fall, candy corn was not always associated with the fall and Halloween season. Now that's interesting. It got moved to Halloween? For the first half of the 20th century, candy corn was a well-known penny candy, or bulk confectionery and it was advertised as an affordable and popular treat that could be eaten year-round. Well, that doesn't seem totally surprising. I could see candy corn as being the random candy in a bowl of candy in somebody's house or a waiting room somewhere. Perhaps that's how some of us first encountered candy corn. I can't remember myself, but I do mostly associate it with Halloween. Candy corn developed into a fall and Halloween staple around the 1950s when people began to hand out individually wrapped candy to trick-or-treaters. 
The harvest-themed colors and increased advertising in the month of October also helped candy corn become a fall staple. The National Confectioners Association has deemed October 30th, the day before Halloween, National Candy Corn Day. Well, since we know that October 30th is already mischief night, and the National Confectioners Association is on its own a little bit shady, which I won't get into here while we're both trying to remain relaxed, I would propose that National Candy Corn Day is properly optional in its observance, if not altogether dubious as a national day. I would say we could ignore it altogether, but truthfully I myself observe so many dubious days, generally food-related, throughout the year that it would be nigh hypocritical for me to be deeply judgmental about this National Day's observance. The National Confectioners Association estimates that around 35 million pounds, over 15,000 metric tons, of candy corn are sold annually. So 35 million pounds, 15,000 metric tons annually, not to date in history, but each year. As of 2016, annual production in the United States was 35 million pounds, or almost 9 billion pieces of candy. The majority of candy corn sales occur during the Halloween season. And as such, it's an appropriate topic for this podcast. Well, that is an astounding amount of candy. I suppose that it's hard to imagine just how large a quantity of that is without having access to other numbers about other candies production. But nine billion pieces of candy corn sounds like a lot. And... Although I don't think I've seen it in a while, I guess that means it really truly is everywhere. It said before that it was developed as a rural candy, so perhaps being a city mouse myself means that I just don't see the millions of pounds of candy corn that are strewn throughout the rural parts of my own state, and indeed this country itself. I suppose it's possible that the bulk of these 9 billion pieces of candy, these 35 million pounds, are just covering homes and driveways throughout the Midwest, piled high on tables, piled high on any available surface, perhaps. Perhaps as precipitation they are rained down upon the homes of maybe gracious people? Do people whose homes are covered in candy corn appreciate it? Well, we're really going kind of far afield here with my imagination, but... I got some kind of cloudy with a chance of meatballs impression of the saturation of candy corn in other parts of the country from where I live. So maybe there are places where large swaths of people are quite in favor of candy corn, and it's only my imagination, and perhaps the imagination of other people on the internet, that candy corn is an abomination. 
How can something that is such an abomination, if it were an abomination, sell 35 million pounds annually? Let's learn some more. Production. Originally, the candy was made by hand. Manufacturers first combined sugar, corn syrup, carna alba wax, and water, and cooked them to form a slurry. Fondant was added for texture, and marshmallows were added to provide a soft bite. The final mixture was then heated and poured into shaped molds. Three passes, one for each colored section, were required during the pouring process. Now there is a citation needed for that passage, so we don't know if that's properly educating us on the production of these candy corns. The recipe remains basically the same today. The production method, called Quote, cornstarch modeling, likewise remains the same, though tasks initially performed by hand were soon taken over by machines made for that purpose. So that's maybe just kind of funny on its own, imagining that, like everything, candy corn was originally handmade. I have this vision of people sitting around a table the way they might today still sit around a table and make dumplings or corn tortillas, molding tiny little tricolor candy corn over and over again. I doubt back then they were making 35 million pounds of it, but if you were to be making candy corn one candy corn at a time, it seems like it would be an impossible task to make enough, even for your neighborhood. Well, here we are, and I suppose somebody figured out that they could make a machine to do the work. And if you would like to know more about the machine that does the work, there is a hyperlink in this wikipedia.org article with more information on the machine itself. If the details of Halloween candy corn were not enough to drive you to unconsciousness, I will read to you from this final passage in the article, which details the widespread repurposing of this witch season wonder and grafts it like Frankenstein's monster onto holidays throughout the North American calendar. These are the variants of candy corn. A popular variation called, quote, Harvest corn adds cocoa powder. It features a chocolate browned wide end, orange center, and pointed white tip. It is often available around Thanksgiving. During the Halloween season, blackberry cobbler candy corn can be found in eastern Canada, as well as candy corn shaped like pumpkins. Confectioners have introduced additional color variations suited to other holidays. The Christmas variant, sometimes called reindeer corn, typically has a red end and a green center. Now that I know for certain I have seen at Christmas time. And I feel like because Christmas time is so widespread, so all consuming, so gigantic 
in North America that there is really nothing surprising to me about Christmas co-opting concepts or ideas from any holiday from anywhere else in the calendar. I would say if anything might be welcome, it would be if Christmas could acquire some of the things I personally like, rather than candy corn, maybe we could have Christmas hot dogs. Maybe that would be a good place to start. I don't think there is a Christmas hot dog yet. And I wouldn't want that Christmas hot dog to be like a season-themed hot dog, like this candy corn that's been colored for Christmas. I don't want like a, you know, winter mint hot dog or a pumpkin spice hot dog. I want, you know, just a Christmas hot dog, which would be a hot dog you have on Christmas. I'll admit, I don't see quite how that's co-opted in the holiday, but, you know, if you're with me on this one, let's get it going. Let's get some Christmas hot dogs on the books. Returning to the article, the Valentine's Day variant, sometimes called Cupid corn, typically has a red end and a pink center. I believe I have seen that as well. In the United States, during Independence Day celebrations, corn with a blue end, white center, and red tip, named Freedom Corn, can be found at celebratory cookouts and patriotic celebrations. I will submit that I have never been to a patriotic celebration if the mark of said patriotic celebration is the presence of freedom corn. Still, it seems pretty obvious. And why not import some of those leftovers to France and some of the other countries with a red, white, and blue flag? Freedom corn would still be freedom corn, perhaps, in France. I'm not going to try and make up what the French wording would be but it probably translates. There is also an Easter variant, sometimes called bunny corn, which is interestingly almost getting us back to the original chicken feed that this was called. Bunny corn is typically only a two-color candy, and comes with a variety of pastel bases, pink, green, yellow, and purple, with white tips all in one package. I think, therefore, we would just presume, although it doesn't say so here, that the Easter, the dual-colored Easter candy corn is meant to resemble Easter eggs, with the white and then some other pastel color, which would be painted on the Easter egg. There have also been caramel apple and green apple, s'mores and pumpkin spice, carrot corn, green and orange with a carrot cake flavor, and birthday cake candy corn flavors. See, now we're getting into that sort of Wonka direction. Maybe I could get into candy corn in the future 
if there's more of these like wild flavor combinations where each color carries a different flavor. We did learn that the company that makes the most candy corn is the Jelly Belly Company, so they've got the flavors. They just need to bring it on home. Maybe we can get that going too. So, multi-flavored candy corn, that maybe those three elements make up a familiar dish, a familiar type of food, somewhere within the wheelhouse of the Jelly Belly, you know, universe. And then on the other side, as we discussed earlier, Christmas hot dogs. Candy corn flavored snacks have become more widely available with candy corn flavored variants of snack foods and candy, including Oreos, M&Ms, marshmallows, and more. So that's, I suppose, another thing, which is that not only is there the potential flavoring of candy corn to other things, there is the other things that are flavored like candy corn. So, candy corn flavored marshmallows, candy corn flavored M&Ms, candy corn flavored Oreos, I think I would like to know what else is on that list, but the thing is, is that candy corn is really just, if I'm not mistaken, just sugar flavored. The thing is that candy corn doesn't have a lot of its own personality. I think I would have to try the Oreos, M&Ms, or marshmallows to see how I feel about things flavored like candy corn. But I would have to admit the possibility that I might like an M&M, Oreo, or Marshmallow, or otherwise candy corn flavored experience more than I like the candy corn itself. I don't know, maybe, maybe not. I think we could probably lean towards not on that one. But, who knows? If you have a particular candy corn flavored snack food that you like, let me know. Well, even a particular ponder can give way to a ramble, albeit only a few small ones. I hope you feel the same way. If there is another specific particular topic you would like to ponder with me, let me know. I would like also to address that wikipedia.org is a valuable resource to us all, and if you like to use it as much as I do, or like to hear me use it as much as I like to ramble about for you, I would appreciate your consideration to make a small donation to the organization. I think we'll leave it here for this sugary bonus episode of Ryan Rambles You to Rest. I hope you have been adequately rambled to rest and are not hearing what I am saying right now. However, if for some reason you are conscious at this time, I will leave you with these parting words. Ill. Polite. Attempt. 
unnatural. Bed. Unkempt. Good. Fact. Kick. And unsightly. Thank you again. I am your host, Ryan. Music has been by Disparition. And I'll see you next time.